we ended up doing more experiments and more things that were close to experiments. podcast uh, of the mixtape, uh, the podcast. I had the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Hito Embens, uh, Stanford University. Dr. Embens is the 2021 co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, which he won with Josh Angrist and David Card. Dr. Embens uh, is also a distinguished scientist at Amazon and has been credited uh, with, uh, he was credited in his Nobel Prize uh, uh, the Nobel Committee credited the prize for his uh, pioneering work on the local average treatment effect and instrumental variables uh, in his work uh, in the 1990s with Josh Angers. As always, uh, I appreciate you coming and listening to the podcast. I'm Scott Cunningham. Okay, uh, so today I have uh, the pleasure of having uh, Hito Embens, uh, the, the October uh, who won the Nobel Prize in economics in uh, October. Uh, it's really great to see you again, Hito. Uh, I wanted to say, um, I'll, I still remember the first time we met. Um, we were at our annual professional conference for economists, and I basically cold called you and uh, asked if you wanted to come have a beer with a few of us to watch the Alabama-Georgia championship game, and and uh, you came. And I, uh, uh, you didn't know any of us, and I've always thought, this is how I think of Hito Embens, socially, extremely friendly, <laughs> uh, unassuming, very kind, very open. And so it's really nice to get a chance to talk to you again. Oh, yeah. And I, so I, have, I have good memories from uh, from watching that that game. And I appreciate the invitation at the time. Yeah. You know, it, was, it was fun. And, you know, the sending that invitation was, was a good idea. And kind of the things you've been doing for the profession. Oh, uh, with the the AA five K, yeah, where I won my other award last year. <laughs> yeah, the, um, was, I, th I think that's a great idea. I think we kind of need to have more of that type of thing. I don't think the profession does does a particularly good uh, good job. Yeah, in making everybody feel part of that, and I think this type of of uh, activity is actually super helpful in, in building more of a community. Yeah. You know, I was just about to say that you had a big year. You, you won two big prizes. You won the Kaplan Nailbuff award for uh, yeah. coming in the 64th percentile. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I, I tried to win it again this year and I, and right, I, I, I slowed it. down a, a little yeah. bit. So I, th I think it came in around the 80th percentile. Or yeah, something. that's yeah. right. It gets harder. It's harder yeah. to nail that one. That That's uh, not, you can't manipulate the running variable on that one very easily. No, no, exactly. So it's, uh, <laughs> but. well, so I, I wanted to, uh, uh, start and kind of I'd broken up my my interview notes into basically three things um, the past um, this period of time maybe just talking about career setbacks as well as the the future and so the the first thing I was wanting to tell you is that this morning my mom like a lot of people loves Wordle and she was telling me that she loves it because it's a puzzle uh, unlike crossword puzzles, which to her is not a puzzle. And it reminded me of something that I heard you say. You said your passion for econometrics came in childhood because of your love of chess. And um, I was curious about that because I don't think uh, people have probably heard that before. A lot of people play chess, but don't know that about econometrics. Yeah, so, so I, um, now I grew up in the Netherlands. So that, the educational system is a little different. It's kind of more like the German system. So you have to you don't apply for for a particular college or a particular university as much as you apply for a particular major. Mm -hmm. So so when while in high school you need to apply to study mathematics in a particular place or languages or the sociology or psychology. And so I wanted to do something that was like mathematics because I, I enjoyed that. I was, I felt I was, was good at it, but I didn't want to do pure mathematics. Uh, so I was kind of trying to figure out what to do. And, and my, uh, 
economics teacher in high school gave me this book by Tim Bergen, the, this kind of thin book about econometrics. And I'm mm. not sure I really made, made that much of it, but it sort of did seem like a good combination of having a lot of mathematics in it, but also having some, some relevance. Tim Berger oh. was kind of a very famous uh, person in, in Holland, not just kind of for his scientific work, but he'd done a lot of, of public policy work. He'd set up essentially the, the equivalent uh, for the, in the Holland of the Census Bureau and the, the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And so he'd, he'd done a lot of work trying to make economics very relevant for policy uh, for 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 government uh, work and so that was that was very inspiring and you know it, it was kind of even beyond the work he'd done there he was a very inspiring figure in the way uh, after the the uprising in Hungary he'd actually taken in the the Hungarian the refugees in his house mm. he'd done a lot of work for the 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 League of Nations before World War II. And uh, so he was he was just generally regarded as a very inspiring figure. And, and so uh, the book kind of motivated me, inspired me to go study econometrics. That was wow. actually a, a program he'd set up in, uh, in Rotterdam. And wow. so that seemed a very natural choice for me at that point. So you Again, I didn't really know exactly what I was getting into. So but from then the I, very beginning, you were interested in econometrics. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I was really that much interested in it because I didn't really have that much of an idea what it really was. But it, it was, it seemed like a reasonable choice um, in that it ticked off a bunch of, of boxes and then it turned out to be a very good uh, good fit. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. So, so going back to the, the puzzle aspect of it as well, that certainly kind of motivated me. I was, I was, I, I liked the idea of solving puzzles Mm. In some sense, a challenge for me has always been to make sure that I was working on the on the right uh, puzzles, mm. and that, that I was working on things that were actually of, of some general interest. Right. And it, uh, you know, there, I'm not sure I was was very good early on in picking good good problems. Uh, uh, what were you interested in? What were you interested in? in your uh, PhD program, you followed, uh, I just now I'm drawing a blank, but you followed someone to Brown. Uh, yeah, so, so I worked with, so I, I, from Rotterdam, I'd gone on to some exchange program uh, to, uh, to England, to, uh, to Hull in the north of England. Uh-huh. Not for any particular reason, not because I knew anything about the university, but just because there was a exchange program and it was sort of a way of, of going to England for a year. And that seemed like, exciting uh, idea yeah then when i got there it turned out there, there was a econometrician there tony lancaster was actually very good and then and there was another dutch econometric student uh, who came mm. same time and so he, he was very happy having these econometric students there and then it turned out he was about to move to uh to the us to brown and he asked us if we were interested in doing a phd there so that's that's how I ended up at, at Brown. I applied for to a couple of other places, but I I uh, didn't get into a a lot of places. Just nobody from Hull had ever really uh, applied to those programs before, so they didn't really know what to uh, to make of me. Right. Um, but that I I got to Brown, and that again that turned out to be a, a good fit. That was actually a very nice program. Is it common? Is it common in your econometrics community and amongst your friends and others to have been, you know, sort of influenced by singular people like Tim Bergen or or Lancaster? Is that, or are you sort of, is there something about your person, something about you that's sort of been impacted by particular people? No, actually, um, I, I think at some level, I've, there's there've been a lot over the years there've been a lot of people who had a a big influence on uh, on my work and my way of thinking about problems at some point i remember the, one of my co-authors giving a talk richard spady when i was a when i was at harvard and then one of 
the students I was working with at the time said, wow, you kind of have a really eclectic set of co-authors uh, kind of, and he was referring to the, to kind of Josh Angrist and mm. uh, Don Rubin and Richard Spady. And there were kind of a bunch of people and they, they were all quite different in their, in their styles and in the, the problems they were working on. And I think at that time I was very flexible in my, my views. And I, I was, mm. I was kind of interested in, in learning from these, these different people. Yeah. In some sense I've, I've met, I've sort of kept doing that when I was at, uh, when I moved to UCLA, mm. I taught a class with, with Ed Lemer, mm. who's also someone I've, I've learned an enormous amount from. I never, we never actually wrote a paper yeah. together, but I, I he was he was very influential in my thinking about the econometrics and and about the, what are good problems to work on. He uh, was very critical of econometrics at the time. What do you think he? What did he? What do you think he would have think about? What what did, what did he think about the direction that you were going on? Well, so so um, that's a very interesting question, and I said so I'll have a better answer in a couple of weeks. But so, so the I I agree kind of with with all his, his criticisms in his uh, let's take the con out of econometrics paper. Mm -hmm. uh, but he he kind of suggested the direction to resolve these things by doing sensitivity analysis, and in some sense that that didn't catch on nearly as much as it should have probably, but partly because he, he missed or he underestimated the fact that people were going to do experiments and kind of do just more, more credible work where the sensitivity analysis was less of an, uh, an issue. And in that paper, he writes at some point, well, I'm not really talking about experimental work because there, these problems don't, are not, are not as important. And I, yeah. uh, and I think left and said was his view that, well, but we're not doing experiments, so we don't really need to think about that as, as much. And right. that turned out to, to not be quite right, because we actually end up, we ended up doing more experiments and more things that were close to experiments mm -hmm. than, than I think he, he envisioned. Yeah. But actually, so he, the reason I said this, I'll, I'll know more in two weeks, he's actually coming, giving a guest lecture in my my uh, graduate class in, in two weeks uh, so i asked him to come over and kind of talk about yeah his views on uh, on econometrics now and kind of what he was thinking at the time because yeah. that paper was was hugely important right. in in my thinking and it it, it actually featured mm -hmm. not just in my my lecture but also in in josh and david's lectures uh, i think it, it was very influential mm -hmm. for them as well and yeah you know, it's a paper that's got a lot of attention, but still not nearly as much, I think, as its importance uh, yeah. would justify. Yeah. You, you know, it, it's um, uh, because I'm 46 and graduated in 07, um, uh, I've only lived in your timeline. You know, I've only lived in the wake of, of your work. So I don't really know what it was like uh, at the beginning. And so am I right that that this was uh, the work that you were doing with Angrist and Rubin wasn't always received well within the econometrics community, or is it, that's not really the way things were? Yeah, no, I mean, it, that's, uh, that, that's right. There was, I think early on, there were a number of people who thought this was really interesting and really innovative. Uh, so Gary Chamberlain was kind of a big fan of the work early on, but, but, yeah, also uh, people like Whitney Newey thought it was very interesting early on. And, and so I remember the first time I presented it at, uh, at Harvard and people were very curious about it. Mm. But at the same time, it's sort of possibly kind of partly the reason for why people were curious because there was also a lot of people with, with, who thought, no, this was, this was the wrong way to go. This was kind of just not the way things were being done and they you know the, the i think 
one of the 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 specific criticism was that you know you should start by saying what you're interested in mm. you should be clear about what you're interested in and then focus on on estimating that right and what we did was kind of turn that around a little bit we said well you know we might maybe you're interested in the average effect but you can't get that and so we'll we'll just uh, take what uh, what you can get right 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 so that was dissatisfying to some people well, people felt that, that that was you know sort of cheating a little bit saying well right. you, you the we were they felt that that was exposed kind of justifying doing what you were doing rather than than being principled about trying to estimate something and figuring out how to best get at that so and, why did you and josh and ruben end up kind of going down that route if that was so uh uh you know not the way things were done um well so so, so my from my perspective the motivation came out of kind of this this tension between Josh's thesis kind of with the the draft lottery kind of way you had this this instrument that seemed very credible but it was only moving the the fraction of veterans kind of from mm -hmm. about 15 to 30 percent or something uh, mm -hmm. And so there had been these papers by Heckman and Mansky in the, the papers and proceedings in 1990, where they kind of both argued that you couldn't actually identify the average effect the, of, of veteran status in, in cases like that. They, they weren't looking at that example, but they said, if you want to get the average effect of some treatment using an instrument, unless the instrument moves the probability of getting the treatment from zero to one, yeah, you can't get the average effect, right? And so, so kind of on the one hand, there was there were these negative results saying no, you cannot get the average effect, and on the other hand, there was this this application that seemed like that seemed very credible. That seemed like pretty much the best you could do, but it was very far for moving the the treatment probability from zero to one. So we we try so so we try to understand that that uh, tension and see if there was something credible you could learn from that if it was not and we didn't quite formulate it initially that way but if you couldn't get the overall average was there something else you could uh you right. could get and so months right. well you could get the bounce but it, that didn't, didn't seem quite mm. enough for for policy in a lot of cases and so we, we wanted to resolve that and initially from my perspective, that was we were very neutral about it. We didn't say the local average treatment effect is the thing you're interested in. It was just that's what you're getting. Yeah, and right. Understanding right. that seemed very seemed useful to us. And, so, you know, was the potential outcomes model, uh, if you had to rank its importance in making those discoveries about the late theorem? I mean, could you have gone? Were you going to get to it anyway, or is Potential outcomes just really opening it up. No, I think I think that that really that really opened it up. You know, exposed mm -hmm. the math is very very simple. So right. so the initially was there, there's two things there. But so initially we we set up the selection problem itself in terms of a late of a latent index model, right? Where there was there's some and a latent D star that follows some some model, and if that cross the that crosses a threshold, you're you, you serve in the military, and otherwise the, you don't. Right. And so we 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 got the late result in that way. It looks yeah. very messy that way because the, the you no know, we said well we have a continuous unobserved thing, and it yeah. so we, we could have these integrals and stuff, and that the. Uh, but the, the basic result was there. But then Gary Chamberlain said, well, actually, you, you could also think of these, the treatment status in terms of potential outcomes. And that then kind of the proof simplifies to being two or three lines. Mm. And it, it just becomes much, much crisper. Yeah. In fact, that, that also, so Don Rubin made a similar comment where he kind of looked at the argument and said, well, 
this kind of looks interesting, but it looks, you know, if this is true, then really that should be a two line proof. That shouldn't be kind of a page of, of kind of integrals and stuff. Right. And you know, they were both right. And I think that that really simplified the, the exposition and, ma and made it much more, uh, much, much clearer and much better. Yeah. This and so I, th I think the potential outcome set up there was, was hugely important. And I re actually yeah. remember at that time reading the rules, I think it's a 77 paper in the Journal of Edu Educational Psychology, yeah. where, where essentially all he does is, is talk about, you know, you want to think of causal effects as the difference between Y of C and Y of T. Yeah. It's this contrast. And I remember reading that paper thinking, wow, you know, that's, a, yes, that's actually a very helpful way of, of formulating the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that is just much clearer than starting with these st mo modeling things purely in terms of the, the observed outcomes. Right, right, right. And it, the later, sort of around that, well, a little later, but sort of influenced by that, I wrote this book review of Henry's the book on kind of econometrics readings where I, I looked back at Tim Berger's work where for the supply and demand for the simultaneous equation setup, he starts off being very clear in terms of the potential outcomes in a way that still resonates a lot uh, with me. Mm. And it's kind of interesting to see how the the econometricians then generalize that kind of to these simultaneous equations models with k endogenous variables and m exogenous ones, but doing it purely in terms of the the realized outcomes. Right. Kind of, uh, and that I think at that point a lot of the clarity was lost. Yeah. And and we lost kind of the the statistics part of the audience because uh, yeah. it, uh, it didn't really. It wasn't very clear what was meant. Anymore. That reminds but me. Of I your, think the potential outcomes are a big part of. Uh, yeah, made that so clear. That reminds me of your fish, your fishes, fish paper with Grady and Ingress. It seems like that's a explicit remapping back to supply yes. and demand. Yeah, no, that that was the goal of that that paper, kind of mm. just be uh, go back to kind of the Timberg and Havelmo setup, and then kind of showing what that gets you. In right. these, these non-linear, non-homogeneous uh, yeah. settings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so um, the it's funny. I, I feel like they sometimes say, you know, we we've only had like a dozen recessions, you know, in in recorded history. Uh, so we like you know still kind of learning what they are. And I kind of feel like similar about econometrics. We've only seen like a few of these big bursts of influence over the 20th century, but it seems like the spreading of your work through the applied community is really impressive. And, you know, when I think about how we're, we're all, uh, imbenites, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like it's not because the the work ended up in green's econometrics textbook or it's like it moved through the applied community is that is that your is that accurate or what did it look like for you back then well so so i mean certainly at the time i don't you know i, I thought i thought the, the the local average treatment effect paper yeah was was very interesting. I, I remember kind of when we we sort of finished the final piece, and I was just extremely pleased with the way that turned out. I, I felt we'd really figured out something that that people hadn't seen before. Yeah, so I was very happy with it, but I didn't really have any any um, expectations that this this would be some hugely influential uh, piece of work. I was yeah. uh, just happy with uh, having figured that out. Right. The, um, now, sort of what, what happened subsequently, I, th I think partly the potential outcome setup was very helpful. And it, I, 
I think, you know, there's sort of lots of controversy sort of about exactly who should be getting credit for that. And so it's certainly clear that it was explicit in Neyman, mm. it's sort of explicit in Tim Bergen and, and Havelmo, but it had gone and lost in the, in the economics literature. Right. And Ruben's work brought that back um, in the, and the, you can see it, it, it brought it back and that, that became more, more prevalent in economics mm-hmm. prior to my work with Josh. Kind of in, you see that in the 1990 Hackman and the 1990 Monsky papers and it's some of the papers around that time. But I think that did make the statements of the problems just much, much clearer. I mean, yeah. If you go back to the earlier empirical work that uh, that Lima was criticizing, kind of one of the things you would see in those days in empirical work is that people would put in these tables and it, you know, make try to interpret and report all the different coefficients. You would mm-hmm. ha- have a linear regression uh, with with some variable of interest, some variable whose causal factor you're interested in. And then you would have a bunch of other things, but people would still look at all these other coefficients and interpret them essentially the same way. Mm-hmm. There was really no distinction kind of between, between causal variables and, and attributes where the setting things up with the potential outcomes helped being very clear about what, what are actually the things you're interested in. Yeah. And what is the distinction between that and, and attributes? Right, 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 right. Uh, um, uh, I, 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 uh, I love hearing the, the stories. You know, I think that it's like, it's funny when you read the econometrics textbooks, you just kind of like, oh, it's just kind of drop down with Moses on the on Mount Sinai. We're just kind of born with all these, all this, these estimators. And it's funny, I, I, I just never really, you know, I love hearing about the, the fights and the arguments and the seminars and, <laughs> and the, 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 the way it moved. But, you know, you, you had this, this fairly significant career setback. Is that right? When you were the not tenure at Harvard? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I went to graduate school at Brown. So I was, I was extremely fortunate to, uh, to get a job at Harvard. Yeah, and I, I I don't say sort of extremely fortunate there lightly. Kind of I they they hadn't they didn't actually interview me at the meetings. You know the, the the job market system was already the same as it is now. Kind of you have these interviews, then you have these seminars, but so they they didn't interview me at the meetings. But then it turned out they were losing two of their junior faculty in the, that year, and so they mm-hmm. they realized actually they were going to be very short in uh-huh. terms of teaching their courses, and so they actually. They were they were a little desperate to get someone to uh, to teach the the courses that nobody else wanted to to teach yeah. the, the the probability and stats course. So oh. then after the meetings, after they had realized they didn't see anybody at the meetings, they they liked they the Gary Chamberlain called me up and sort of interviewed me over the phone. I said, "Well, you know what." Well, nah, Uh, what are you working on? What is, what is your this this work about? And then he he decided to, uh, to you know, then he invited me to give a talk, and yeah. so it was kind of fairly informal. I don't think even there was a, the it was basically him on his own deciding that. Uh, and so then I gave a seminar uh, there, and they you know they decided okay sure we'll take we'll we'll take a chance. Josh was actually not particularly yeah, in sorry. favor. <laughs> so, <laughs> shame on him. Uh. <laughs> hey, he can't, he's not. He's not calling every. He's not good at calling yeah. every every horse race. Apparently, no, no. I, I, <laughs> well, I, you know, at some level, I, I have sympathy for that. I, I don't think I was doing very particularly interesting work at that time. But it was. Yeah. It, it was. It was the. The it was competent. Uh, it, it wasn't very inspired. <laughs> yeah. And so, so, but, but Gary Chamberlain, who was much wiser yeah. than, uh, than either Josh or me, said, you know, this, this is, this is good. Uh, we'll, we'll take a chance. And so, yeah. uh, and then Josh, to his credit, didn't, uh, didn't sulk, but he actually 
you know, started talking to me, trying to make sure that I was actually working on more interesting things. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Well, so did you have a, a sense that your tenure denial was was probable, or what's it like at Harvard? I mean, it's no, you know, be... I, I think the at Harvard today in those days, and it's probably still true. The tenure, the probabilities are very low, and so I was just very happy. When I got there, I was very yeah. happy to get the chance to go there. I was extremely happy with my experience there, kind of the connecting with Josh, working with, I also did some work with Gary Chamberlain, uh, mm -hmm. the work with Ruba. So, so I was just very happy with my experience there. Then yeah. when I was up for tenure, I wasn't really sure how that was going to go. The, the, I didn't, my... The, I didn't have a huge number of papers at a time. Mm -hmm. the, I thought they were they were good, but they the, I I really was was not sure mm -hmm. which way it would turn out. I think so. I think it was a very reasonable thing for them to think that it was sort of close to the to the margin and, uh, and um, so so I, I think that was that was not a. Uh, unreasonable decision yeah. it was hard to evaluate the 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 low coverage treatment effect paper had right. come out but it wasn't uh, it wasn't clear yet that yeah. took a while to to really get uh, traction right so i think that was a difficult thing to to evaluate uh, yeah. so so i um, and in some sense so so you know I, I i wanted to get tenure there and i was hoping i was getting tenure there but i wasn't I certainly wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting to get turned down either. I was, I was genuinely unsure which way that would that would go. Yeah. And then turned out for my career, it was probably incredibly good to go to uh, UCLA and and just broaden my uh, horizons. Uh, it's it's very good. To, to go to another place for a while and kind of see what what uh, how people think there mm. what people what kind of problems people are working on and so I there at, at UCLA I ended up working a lot with Joe Hotz mm. um, I right. um, I talked a lot I learned a lot from uh, from Ed Lemer so mm. it was actually very very good and then uh, later I had the opportunity to go to Berkeley yeah. And I have David Card as my uh, colleague, and so th those were those were all incredibly good experiences. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How how have you, you know, how how do you deal with uh, uh, disappointment like that? Is there is there something that you've learned over the years to just how disappointment affects you and how you work through it? Yeah, so so the I mean the, the tenure of disappointment in some sense was partly mitigated by the fact that I was very excited getting to LA. I hadn't spent much time in California up to that point. Yeah. And then when I got there, actually it turns out it's incredibly nice there in yeah, LA. Really and I, I lived in Santa Monica. And it was that was that was very pleasant. Yeah. The um, it's the it's also it's so it was good to go to a different place where then from the beginning you play a very different role. And so there at UCLA, I was I was a senior tenured faculty, and so the people there were very nah, happy to have me there. I could kind of choose how to to you know, had influence in, in reorganizing the econometrics program. Mm. And and deciding what I thought was important for the students to uh, to study, and so the, um, it was good to kind of maturing in the, in the profession in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it fits uh, my view of you as uh, someone who is uh, uh, not in a not in a topical way, just genu genuinely a, a person who sees possibilities 
even the way you're describing like learning from other people just the the openness to you know that that you don't really know how thing you know the openness to to new things is that is that kind of uh would do you think that was helpful in in navigating those things yeah so my, so yes some, some of that's that's right and i but i think probably over the years I've lost some of that. Uh, I, I think I think the the being open to new ideas is actually it's very hard. And I think yeah. initially, sort of the time I met Josh, the time I met Don, was a time I was very willing to listen to new ideas and uh, right. new ways of of thinking about problems. I didn't I didn't have very set views on on how econometrics should be done. Yeah. Um, I think now it would be much, much harder for me to to be. You know, I think now it's much more of a challenge to kind of be open to very. So if Uta Pearl comes into your cl- classroom and tries to convince you to start drawing stuff, is, is he going to be as successful now as he would have been? No. So, you- so, so in fact, I think, and I don't know when this was, I think this was late 90s. So this may have I, been when I was at UCLA. The do they actually ask me to if you wanted to write a paper with him kind of on on oh. banks and kind of explain this to economists and i i said well you know this is kind of interesting i think it's worth doing but this is kind of not what i'm doing at the moment and so at that point i felt i had more of a i had my own research yeah. agenda and and i'm i'm not going to do everything that i could be doing i'm i'm going to pick which things you know the uh, are in line with with my views on on what is useful the uh, for for empirical work and i said i felt writing a paper expositing uh graphical methods right the uh, i think that that's sort of worth doing and in some sense you know i wrote this paper for the journal of economic literature a couple of years ago giving my view on that but it would be would be very hard to write that type of paper with the co-author, we might have different views yeah, on exactly sure. what uh, what works. Yeah. And I, I think that's kind of a challenge. That was not as much of a challenge for me early on, where my views were not as, as well-formed, and I was happy kind of to discuss these and, and figure these things out. But right. now, working with the new co-authors, with senior co-authors, when we have strong views themselves, is, is much harder. You know, yeah. I did write this paper at some point with Chuck Mansky, where... We do have have fairly different views on uh, on some topics, but we you know we we were aligned on a on a particular thing, and so so I had a great experience actually working with him. Mm. But I think there, over time, you become a little less flexible. Uh, so you can you know you can try fight that, but it's that's it's hard. Yeah. Well, so you know I, when I think of you. Um, Cause I don't know your full, you know, cause I'm not an econometrician. Uh, I don't know the, the full, the full can you know, corpus of, of your work. I, I think about it as the things I've kind of learned as over the years. And I think about you with Angris, Ruben, um, Alberto Abadie, and then Susan Athey. And I was just wondering, you know, how, what, what's kind of the common, what, what's, you've been so uh, successful in, in those collaborations what's, what's kind of been the common uh sort of secret or what's what, what's the what what is about that is similar and what about each of those has been a little different well so, i mean it, um i mean kind of collaborating with people on on this type of work and where it's it's conceptual work i think you do need to be very aligned in in terms of the overall view, right, right. With the, the, the sort of papers again. So I I think very highly of Pearl's work. I think it's it's incredibly important. But I think that it. Uh, but there's kind of a lot of papers now that I think are very good that I wouldn't want to write. Uh, right. And so I, I when I collaborate with people, I need to be someone in, uh, in sync with their views on. Uh, on, on problems and and even kind of a little bit on the style of uh, of writing papers and so right. uh, 
with with Josh, I've, I, I go way back, and so I understand how he thinks about these problems, and I, I really value his his views. Hmm. I kind of same with the that was the same with Gary Chamberlain when I worked with him, uh, who is uh, incredibly influential uh, for my for shaping my views. But and it's the same with Alberto and uh, and Susan. Uh, uh, with Alberto, kind of, I've, I have this whole sequence of of papers where we just work very closely together, and he's just incredible to uh, to work with. Because mm. the same with uh, with Susan. Uh, but it's the uh, because the these people are all so good. It is it is very hard because they all have different views on some of these things, and so it, it takes a lot of of mutual respect to be able yeah. to work effectively uh, with with those people. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, of all of them, the one that surprises me the most would be uh, Susan because of her, you know. <laughs> her IO and micro theory and, and just this distinguished prior career, I, you know, I was telling somebody, you know, she'll win that when she wins the Nobel, there'll be this like uh, early Susan, late Susan, a the, you know, that they, they will be so different uh, because I didn't really always see her as an econometric econometrician. And she so clearly is one of the most important econometricians now. And I was just wondering was that, did you, was that a collaboration that you saw coming? Um, and has that been? No, no, it's, it's the difference with Susan is she's, she's uh, incredibly broad and incredibly fast. And so she's mm -hmm. very fast at uh, getting up to speed in, in different areas. And so she kind of really got started in the, the machine learning literature, because she was working with people at Microsoft, she was chief economist there. And so she was talking to all the, all the people there about, about their problems. I said, so at that point, I hadn't really paid much attention to that, uh, that literature. And I'd, right. I'd seen a little bit kind of of, the, of Tip Sharani's lasso stuff. Uh, and I thought that was, that was interesting, but I didn't really appreciate the, the, importance of of a lot of the machine learning uh, stuff but so susan got into that and she was she was telling me about uh, these things i said at that point the kind of unlike the early 90s when i just started out it was hard, much harder for me to kind of get interested in new things because there was there was i was much busier i had much less time for kind of just reading new things but right. uh, susan was kind of was doing more and more of that stuff so i so at some point i got got more and more curious mm. about what that that was about and so uh, then so she convinced me that these were actually really important uh, things and so we started thinking about these uh, these machine learning problems and yeah. turned out she was she was right these, these are actually just incredibly important uh, things hmm. and so the you know the way i see it kind of over the arc of my career the kind of the the causal stuff has changed econometrics a huge amount but now the all the machine learning stuff is really the the other big change in the way I think about the econometrics and it, yeah. the way we, we practice is changing, partly fueled by the empirical work, partly fueled by, by technical innovations. Uh, but th those are just the two big changes. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, there, and Susan was kind of just, was without Susan kind of being interested in those things, I, I probably would have been much slower in, in getting moving in that uh, direction. Uh, Nah, as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't quite know how to articulate this, but the, the, the synergies between um, the, the uh, PhD economics labor market and tech seems to be kind of bridging a little bit on y'all's work of this machine learning causal inference, because the sense I get is that, you know, the first mover advantage in tech was machine learning and so causal inference is kind of coming later 
but it seems like it's in really huge demand. And the view is that, uh, you know, econometrics in your work in particular uh, and the work with Susan is, is, has got a lot of, a lot of value is how, how, how collaborative, what's that, what's that interaction been like with the, with commerce, with tech uh, on your own, you know, what you're seeing in terms of this call yeah. reference econometrics? I mean, it's, it's been very interesting. Uh, and so, so I hadn't really anticipated that moving here when Susan and I moved here in 2012, I, I wasn't really focused on that. No, as much again, Susan at that time was already working with Microsoft, so she had a better sense of the, the opportunities there. But initially, when I came here, I wasn't interacting that much with the, with those companies. So I, I set up this seminar here, kind of a more data science seminar, and I I had some people from the tech companies from Facebook, uh, Google, coming and giving talks, and in fact, I spent the summer. Uh, as an intern at Facebook, kind of just you, talking I, to the people there. Yeah, the because uh, you have working, a few social working. network uh, cause, causal estimate causal effects off a social network. One with Dean Eccles. Right? Yeah, the, the, the paper with Dean Eccles was written that uh, that summer, and mm -hmm. it, it was partly for me to kind of understand that I was interested in what type of problems they were interested in. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Pat later, a little later, Pat Byrie asked me to give some lectures at, at Amazon, and I did that. And then uh, he said, "Well, do you want to come and, and talk to us more regularly?" And so I started doing that, and that's just been really interesting. Yeah, uh, just actually seeing what problems they're interested in, what questions they 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 think are important. Yeah, and then thinking about how. For some of them, the, the econometrics is there. For some of them, we know how to answer those things. But there's a lot of questions that we haven't actually thought about. And so yeah. it's, it's been very inspiring to uh, talk to the people there and to uh, uh, develop new methods motivated by that. I said I have, I have two papers with uh, Susan and uh, Raj Chetty that are kind of partly motivated by some of the substantive problems Raj was working on, partly motivated by, by some of the problems uh, I've seen in the, the tech world, kind of on combining experimental and observational data. Mm. And there, there, but from my perspective, part of the motivation just came from, from talking to people at the, at the various companies, kind of thinking about what, how they're analyzing data, how they're making uh, decisions. And so yeah. it, it's been, been very inspiring. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Where, so where do you see, where do you see all this now that, you know, it, it seems like causal inference is uh, uh, very mature. I mean, it's, it's funny. I, I've taught it so many times now and, and uh, think about it, think about your work a lot and um, think about it in a different way though, because I'm not an econometrician. So I'm always trying to figure out the, the the, the lines back. It's funny to think if you see causal inference in terms of, of you know, Neiman and, and Fisher, what, what an incredible body of work now exists uh, that just is, is just as important as the randomized control trial, um, which to a lot of people that's, they can't even, they wouldn't believe me. Well, I mean, you know, to be fair, I, th I think sort of Ever since since econometrics got founded as a discipline sort of in the 1920s, I, I think the causal inference was was implicitly a big part of that. And right. I, you know, you can you can trace, you can look at uh, Sewell Wright's work. You can look at the, the work by Timberg and uh, or Havelmo. It was sort of very. It wasn't explicit there about causality, but it, it was sort of clear that that's, that's, they were, it was not explicit in the sense that they were not actually using the word causal as much as we do now, right. but that's what they were interested in. And yeah. all the structural econometrics kind of in the, the 50s and 60s, all the cause foundation the stuff was all about uh, structural causal effects. Uh, right. And so 
there, there is there's some kind of relabeling, but but I think the language matters and kind of be explicit that some of the things we look at are causal and some are not. Yeah, is is very helpful. Yeah, but the um, and clearly a lot of has been done in the last thirty years on that. But the questions kind of were always uh, were always there, and so so I think the you know some of the the division between reduced form and, and structural work, as I think some of the labeling there is, is not very fortunate. Yeah. You know, clearly the instrumental variables work going back again to to Wright and, and uh, Timber was was structural. Mm. And it was kind of very different from the type of work people were doing in the statistics literature. And, it, the, and so I, I see the local average treatment effect work as as fitting in that that line. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that that's uh, um, that's uh, that's right. Well, so I mean, uh, yeah, that's interesting. So um, uh, I guess my my last question is, uh, where where do you see, you know, so some some young person is picking up uh, Angerson Evans ninety four and uh Inbins and Rubin uh 2015 the way you did with Tim Bergen and um and just getting inspired where, where do you see things going now with these with the uh, with uh you know the developments in con in in causal inference kind of your this lineage of work that you've been that I kind of see in your your wake where, where do you see it going in the future well so, so I, th I think um we you know, and I, I think there's some work going in that direction. We need to integrate kind of some of the the theory and the empirical work, kind of what you see in the in the the good empirical work in the, these days. And that goes that goes even towards the design of experiments. One of the things I'm I'm working on at the moment is looking at the design of experiments in settings where there's where there's complicated patterns of uh, of interference or spillovers, mm. and so it's sort of clear that you can't allow for unrestricted patterns of spillovers. If right. everybody affects everybody else, then then you kind of stuck because you don't have have repeated samples so, right. or replicates of the. But you can do much better than, than saying that everybody is, is uh, separate. Right. And so there, I think, you know, economists are used to thinking about how people interact, and especially in marketplaces, we put a lot of structure on how, on how people interact. And so there's, yeah. kind of, there's very interesting work going on on doing experimental designs in these, these marketplaces. Mm -hmm. Stefan Varga has some, some work in there where he looks at, settings where people where the spillovers come purely through prices mm. uh, and as i've done some work where the um, you do experiments kind of settings where you have two sides of a market you have say the products and customers and you can randomize the products you can randomize the customers or you can randomize both at the same time mm. exactly what 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 are good designs there it's going to depend on how the spillovers how the, in, the interference arises. And so I think there's a lot of, but so you need to put some, some structure on there, some economic structure on there. Right, right. So right. even for experimental design, it's not just about the statistics, it's about the, the economic uh, content. Yeah, yeah. And so I, th I think that's an interesting area. I think yeah. kind of more generally combining observational data and, and experimental data, I think is, 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 very interesting i think kind of finding ways of making the graphical modeling the uh, have an impact in uh, in economics is would be very interesting yeah so th i think there's there's still lots of stuff uh, to be uh, to be done uh, in this uh, this area yeah well it's such a, a fun time to to see you and i really appreciate you uh uh, coming on here and, and let me get to talk to you a little bit more. Um, congratulations again on a 
No, uh, great no year. Thanks, thanks for having me. I see the cat there in the background. So. Yeah, this is Betty. She's. Okay. Uh, I've got another one down there, Ronnie, uh, but she's she hides in the paper, the box of paper. So <laughs> very good, very good. Okay, no, I th- I, you know, I, I think it's great the, doing these things at it, the, and sort of the other stuff you've done, as I said, with the AA five K. I think some of the ways of of building community yeah. and. Um, and giving people some historical perspective is yeah. uh, is very helpful. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think that uh, you know a lot of people don't know what economics is, and and you you can say, well, let me just get give you a book or something. But I think we we mainly kind of learn things from people and seeing people and learning their stories, and then we see we see who we want to be. And we kind of get attracted to the things that they're interested in. And it's, you know, for a field like economics, it's not like engineering or law. Nobody, nobody seems to get it right outside of the field, even what we do for a living. Yeah. No, no. So, so, as I said, that when I uh, I was teaching in the fall of 2020, when I started teaching online, I actually, I brought in a couple of guest speakers on Zoom. So I I had Dan McFadden and, and Andrew Galman. And at a, the, the students just found it very interesting. And yeah. So next week I'll have have Ed Lemer kind of talk about some of his stuff. And I, I think I think that's great for for the students to see. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for letting me talk to you. I appreciate it a lot. Great to talk to you, Scott. Okay. Take care.